Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live for the 4 o'clock show. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech. And I'd like to say that it's very important that not only the United States, but Hawaii think globally. We have to see it the way Thomas Friedman sees it. We have to see a global world here, like it or not. That's the way things are now. And Hawaii cannot afford um, to be not global. And so that's why we like to talk to Russell Hanma. <laughs> Russell Hanna is the senior APEC official in Hawaii. He's the um, author of the master plan, the APEC master plan, and he follows APEC very carefully. That's the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. I get that right? Yes, Jay. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me again. And uh, I enjoyed this uh, Think Tech Hawaii show. And uh, I can uh, alliterate some of the issues that's uh, very important to our community and what affects Hawaii. Yeah. Well, today we reserve this time for you and me to talk about. Uh, Donald Trump's tariffs, and to put them in perspective, to look at them, you know, in the continuum of American diplomatic and, and global business history, and to see uh, why they happened, um, what, they're, what, what effect they're going to have, and uh, how that will affect us, not only in the United States, but in Hawaii. So let's talk about tariffs in general. What is it, and why are these tariffs different from all the other tariffs? Yeah, let me, uh, Jay, explain what really tariffs mean. Tariffs is a word that they use for taxes, like uh, putting linen on some of the imports that we bring in from foreign countries. And for example, the uh, U.S. Customs here with the border control, uh, they're under the Homeland Security. Uh, the U.S. Customs actually looks at the uh, Levi's, the uh, import taxes of every items that's uh, imported into us. Into the, from different uh, country of origin. For example, uh, you have uh, like machine parts or uh, aluminum or a steel that we're going to be talking of coming from China. And uh, China is a communist country, but we don't have any uh, free trade agreement with them. So we give the uh, 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 certain tariff import tax percentage. And just recently, Donald Trump signed the executive order on March 1st, giving 25% import tax tariffs on steel materials. That's a pretty high uh, tariff, isn't it? Yes, 25%? and 25% uh, on steel and 10% on aluminum. And I think what he wants to do is kind of uh, help out the American uh, manufacturing, especially for the uh, steel mills and aluminum mills that we produce in the U.S. soil. Mm. For example, we have companies like U.S. Steel Corporation, uh, Neckar, or uh, companies like uh, in aluminum, we have uh, Kaiser Aluminum, mm -hmm. uh, Reynolds Aluminum. So these big multinational companies, they do have a million. And even steel, if you break it down into steel commodities, uh, see, my, I myself was an uh, industrial technology major in college, and I, my, my uh, major was in metals and metallurgy. So there's a different uh, types of steel that you can use. It could be hot, cold steel or non-ferrous steel. Hot, cold and, uh, uh, is difference between how much carbon steel is in there. And uh, when you say carbon steel, there's basically the construction materials that you use, like rebars or channels. And, uh, and non-ferrous metals is like uh, with, without the carbon contact in there. It could be cobalt, aluminum, or it could be uh, uh, different kind of alloys of uh, graphite kind of materials. But basically, uh, 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 non-carbon steels are called non-fossil. Uh, uh. That's a big one, because we've been buying a lot of steel from China. And this is a direct effect on China. <clears throat> and you said a minute ago that we don't have a trade agreement with China, uh, which is interesting, because we could be in a trade agreement with China with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But uh, Trump bowed out of that, so we don't have that. We don't have any trade agreement with them. And now, to add insult to injury, if I can say that, um, he is laying a 25 percent tariff. So does he have the power to do this, Russell? Can he wake up one morning with a, you know, a headache or something and decide he wants to lay <laughs> a 25 percent tariff on steel around the world? 
I think, you know, study, I don't think he can do this overnight. I know that there must have been a complaint through the American industry, because you got to go through the, uh, the Commerce Department, and there we have an International Trade Administration that looks into if it's being harmful to our American industry here. And in this case, uh, what Donald Trump is using this uh, uh, tariffs on the steel and aluminum is because it affects our national security. And there's a provision called Section 232 of the National Security Act that calls about it's going to be harmful to bring in these uh, cheap steel and aluminum from foreign countries that hurts our industries here. For example, our U.S. Steel Corporation, our Bethlehem Steel, uh, uh, Steel Digital Company, on uh, all these multinational uh, steel uh, companies that's, you know, part of our uh, heartlands that produces manufacturing, if it hurts our industry here, taking our jobs away. And I know they did a numbers. Uh, roughly in year 2016, they brought roughly $29 billion of uh, steel into the import into the United States. From, and, from and, China, mostly? Uh, mostly from China and different countries as well. And uh, $17 billion worth of aluminum. Uh, so it kind of tells you that— And that the, came mostly from Canada, no? Yeah, Canada is one of the be, um, most uh, importers for steel and aluminum. But, but he's giving an exemption to Canada, isn't he? Uh, Canada, so because they, of the sort of negotiation. tearing the bottom out of that increase in, in that tariff that he— So on day one, he makes the tariff, and after changing his mind a couple of times, he sticks with it, and then he gives an exemption to Canada, which is the biggest exporter of aluminum to the United States. I don't understand that. He's, he's taking the bottom out of, out of his own initiative um, by, by exempting Canada from the 10 percent on aluminum. Right? Yeah, I think uh, but that's because uh, I think right now we're negotiating the NAFTA agreement with Canada and Mexico. The negotiating North, chip. The North American uh, Free Trade Agreement, yeah. NAFTA. So yeah. I think he wants to make sure that uh, all the, if we can renegotiate the terms and condition of the NAFTA agreement, then he will consider or uh, Levi the non-tariff agreement for steel and aluminum. Oh, I see. So okay. that is a trade-off. I think uh, yeah. Trump is trying to work out a deal with uh, Canada Bargaining and chips, as he so often does, bargaining chips. <clears throat> so in the case of China, you mentioned also there was something in the, in the law about national security for the United States. So uh, uh, are we saying that the United States military, for example, is buying steel from China? We do have some steel companies here. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we are asking China to build as naval uh, vessels. Some of these PTA boats or smaller vessels are uh, made in China. <laughs> and got, that kind of fixed the uh, uh, Jones Act as well. But uh, really I know at one time, some of these uh, congressional delegates were trying to pass a bill in the Congress saying that uh, they want to change the Jones Act as well. Uh, having some percentage, like 25 percent, can be made in, uh, in China with China labor and China yeah. steel, yeah. the materials. <laughs> so that's a concern. But now with the Trump administration, that's going to be uh, off the books now, because we want to protect our industry here and uh, create more jobs by using our American raw materials here. Yeah, well, we, but we don't really have all that much, uh, all that robust uh, steel industry or aluminum industry. We have some, but not that much. What's, what's the effect for somebody, a company that's buying steel, for example, from China, when they have to, all of a sudden, we have a 25 percent uh, tariff, and that means a 25 percent increase in the cost of steel to that company. Uh, and, that, and that same company cannot, cannot go around and find steel that's cheaper uh, than what it could get from China. What, what happens? What's the economic effect of that kind of tariff? No, I think you already seen it. You know, as soon as uh, March 1st, uh, uh, when Donald Trump, uh, the president, signed the executive order putting the tariffs on steel and aluminum, I think the stock market kind of went up for the steel and aluminum manufacturers in the, uh, in the U.S., as well as some of these uh, automobile industry, uh, the Detroit uh, top three uh, automakers, uh, the stock market for them went down like 4 mm. percent. But if you look at the uh, aspect of the raw materials of the steel and aluminum industry, they're probably projecting uh, 5 to 6 percent of uh, increase in their profit and in a return, retain earnings. Of steel. You steel and for their business. But what about, like, for example, the car industry here in, in the United States? They're going to have to pay more for steel. That's, you know, whether it's uh, to Chinese steel with the tariff or whether it's to American manufacturers, 
who are clearly less efficient and charge a higher price. That's why this is all happening. Um, they're going to pay more for steel, period. And that means you and I are going to pay more for our cars because we'll have, they will pass that additional tariff expense on to us as consumers. It's always the way it works, isn't it? Yeah, I think if you look at the economic, I think they did the numbers for the U.S. Commerce Department that uh, uh, with the uh, tariffs that they're going to put, they're going to, the automobile industry, the price might go up from uh, X factory uh, price to wholesale to uh, suggested retail price, might be 4% increase. So I think uh, that's going to be the economic impact, as well with the uh, industry that uses steel, uh, you know, that might benefit them as well, so. Them meaning? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost of good returns and uh, other thing, if you look at what Donald Trump did with, with the corporate taxes, I know that with 35%, uh, he lowered it to 21%. So there's a margin of difference of 14 percent from 35 to 21 percent. 39 percent to 21. Yeah, so it's more than 14. It's 15, exactly. It's, so it's, so it's in other words, cents, so 18 in other words, uh, there's a 14 percent of difference. So the corporate uh, structure-wise, uh, they can use that 14 percent to benefit their employees how they want to do it. That's why you see a lot of these companies are giving employees bonuses, or uh, it might be another. Uh, Golden parachute kind of concept. Well, I think for the he, he was jawboning them there more, at the beginning, uh, and that's why for them. a lot of the banks, uh, including here, you know, gave bonuses to their. But the, you said can do it; they don't have to do it. So they can do you know, the, these companies, the banks, and others. Uh, they they realize the huge windfall of the difference between twenty one percent and thirty nine percent tax rate, and they have a lot. They have cash sloshing around now because of that, and so he was jawboning them. You know, he should give. You should give some bonuses, um, you know, to your employees. But in fact, they're not obligated to do that, and they may decide not to do it ever again, right? Yeah, it's up to the, it's up to the decision, the board of director, the management decision. Yeah. You got to understand between is it a private firm or is it a, is it a public uh, yeah. owned by stockholders? Yeah, so uh, that's, the decision making uh, is going to be different in those yeah. kinds. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, what I see here is that these companies. Maybe not all of them. Maybe some of them will be, you know, good guys, but not all of them. Uh, they, some, maybe some of them, many, many of them will say, well, OK, we gave you a bonus. That's it. No more bonus. And we're going to keep the rest of it for our stockholders and, and whatever we want. Um, so there's no guarantee here that, um, you know, that Tax Reform Act is actually going to have an effect, uh, a long term effect on their employees. There's no guarantee of that at all. Uh, furthermore, it uh, seems to me that this, um, this uh, tariff is not necessarily going to have the effect that Donald Trump wanted to have, namely to encourage, incentivize the American steel industry. Um, it, it, will, it will certainly incre increase the price of steel to consumers and consuming intermediate manufacturers, but it, it doesn't necessarily—am I right? Yeah, I think in terms of uh, there will be some ramifications, some impact as it, but you got to see which industry is going to uh, benefit or not. So would you have done this? Oh, uh, I think uh, if you look at it from a uh, uh, home rules of uh, bringing, if you want to beef up the American industry, uh, but does it does it beef up American industry? Does think, it really do that? I mean, for example, the Jones Act you mentioned in passing a minute ago. Um, was intended in, what was it, 1919 or something, uh, to beef up the um, American shipbuilding industry. It hasn't had that effect at all. Mm -hmm. I think what it's might, done is increases the what, price mm -hmm. of, of ships. I, I think what's going to do, you see a lot of speculation, and that's exactly what happened with the stock market after the executive order, and uh, based on uh, which commodities you're dealing with. And uh, But uh, in the long term, you might, sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. So there will be competition from abroad. And I notice right now these other countries are buying out other uh, steel mills and different, uh, uh, for example, Japan is buying it, this company, the Nippon Steel, the uh, Sumitomo Metals are investing in India and buying out a lot of uh, steel mining over there. And you see a lot of what the companies like in uh, Spain. Spain is a, a big steel mining company. Uh, uh, corporations. Well, why, they build why, why are they building. doing that, Russell? Why are they doing they, that? Because right now they know it's volatile. Uh, the market is uh, uh, out of speculation, so they figured they got to jump on the opportunity right now. 
or else uh, it'll be harder. So it's, it's, a, it's a business gamble that they take. Well, but, does this make uh, America a, 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 a bigger exporter of steel? I'm not sure America was that big an exporter, big an exporter of steel in the first place, because we obviously have been importing from China. Mm -hmm. So are we leaving the world stage on the possibility of exporting now? Actually, if you look at the history, uh, before China, it was South Korea, uh, and uh, they were the steel builder, and they're the, one of the best dip, uh, steamship or uh, shipbuilders. Yes, they and are. And before that, it was Japan was one of the best steel, yes. and uh, they were the best uh, shipbuilders. Yes. So, well, as the economy changes and gets developed nation, now everything's kind of focused on China because China's economy is booming, and they're being more industrialized, and they got so much raw materials there that they can come up with uh, uh, different kind of metal properties and between non-ferrous and ferrous metals. But they're in a great place because they've got the uh, the iron ore, they've got the coke. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, in Africa and South America, they, they and they've got steel mills, Chinese steel mills in both of those places. They're, they're building steel like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I don't know uh, how American steel can compare, can, can compete with the steel the Chinese have been selling, not necessarily in this country, but all over the world. Yeah, I know. So, I, I, are I, we I, kidding ourselves, mm -hmm. Russell? We can always, uh, what's going to happen in terms of domestic demand or exporting, depending on what uh, commodities we're going to be manufacturing, it could be washing machine, dryers, it could be industrial products for kitchen stuff, or, uh, or it could be automobiles, or different kind of uh, 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 materials they're going to be implementing. But uh, I think you got to look at the, uh, more of the micro aspect. And think about not only are we going to bring the raw materials itself in the billet form, or are we going to bring iron core or different kind of uh, mining uh, chemicals that, that make steel composition. Uh, so those things are not addressed yet. And I know that right now it takes about a one month to address it to the World Trade Organization that we are going to uh, protest yeah. and put this anti-dumping kind of kind of value, yeah, kind of bill yeah. of value wanna, act on. I want to uh, talk to you about that right after this break because the the appeal of this there still is a possibility of an appeal of this tariff that he put in place. It's already in place, um, but there are appellate procedures. And when we come back from this break, I want to talk about them and and figure out with you what's, what's going to happen with them. That, that's Russell Hanwa. He's the senior APEC official in Hawaii, and he's into uh, trade and trade agreements around the world, and he's certainly into tariffs, because tariffs have a tremendous effect on that. We'll be right back. You'll see. Aloha kako. I am Andrea, I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m., only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. <music> Bingo. So we have a really interesting trade situation here. We have the United States isolating itself out of trade agreements all over the world. Um, and we have tariffs. We're building walls. And only you know, the wall in Mexico is one thing. These are tariff walls. And they have an effect uh, diplomatically on those countries with whom we have been trading. Some of our best trading partners have got shut out because of these tariffs, right? I mean, we gave exemption to um, Canada and Mexico but uh, not to anybody else just yet. And as you said, this is, this is probably going to go up to the, the, the uh, appellate process about tariffs. What happens? He's not final on this, right? The president is not final if he gets a, a, a bad headache one morning and decides he's going to put tariffs up and build walls and tariffs. That's not final. What happens? I think it's that, that the president did uh, send a message with the United States uh, Trade Representative's office 
the executive office of the president. Then we have our ambassador, uh, Robert Leinenheiser, who's our United States trade representative. Uh, and uh, he has to show a report to the Congress. There's a complaint made, and they did a thorough study with the International Trade Administration that uh, it, uh, the steel and aluminum does harm our country, selling it below the fair market value as a dumping law, especially if they're targeting China. But in uh, uh, but in terms of Canada and Mexico, because of the NAFTA agreement status right now, we're negotiating, so he made that exemption. But if you look at focus like Korea, too, because we get a lot of steel coming in from oh, uh, yeah. South they're Korea. Great, they're shipbuilders. And uh, we have a Korea, uh, a U.S., uh, South Korea trade agreement right now. And I think Donald might, might want to, uh, the president might want to see to see if he can renegotiate mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. I think they're... South Korea is our number one of our allies, and we're working on a deal with uh, North Korea right now. So I think we don't want to make too much of. Okay, uh, so th those are the issue forces. Right now. You have somebody who <clears throat> was affected by dumping, arguably, and uh, you, that's a pretty sophisticated claim to make. You have to show that uh, the the person offending, in this case China, is selling steel in this country for less than its cost, something along those lines. I have to make an analysis and satisfy that panel. Um, that um, that it was dumping, um, and then that panel what can reverse the president? Is that what happens? I think there, instead of panel, uh, what's going to happen is uh, if he does Levi uh, the executive order, you have a uh, there has a U.S. Customs and the court. Uh, there's International Court of Justice uh, under the U.S. Customs, and I, I know when I was in New York City, we had an international court system there. And uh, they hear the hearings between the plaintiff and the defendant. So, so and uh, in other words, if it's going to affect the uh, uh, U.S. industry, for example, U.S. Steel Corporation or Bethlehem Steel or Norcor or yeah. uh, Steel Digital yeah. wants to protest saying that we have a company from China selling it below the fair market. And if yeah. they can uh, take it, uh, file a complaint, and try to bring it up to the court so, system. If the court system wins, and they're going to have to comply to the uh, World Trade Organization. There's a big umbrella organization called WTO. And I remember, like, year 2002, when uh, President Bush tried to uh, protest and put a Levi on the, uh, on the steel imports. But I think the World Trade Organization uh, stricken that out and uh, kind of uh, took that out and deferred the uh, uh, complaint from the U.S. Right? Okay, but here, so, so say U.S. Steel, I've been making this up, U.S. Steel decides that China is dumping. U.S. Steel goes to the WTO or the customs uh, regulators, and it says they're dumping, okay? The customs regulators make some decision, yes, they're dumping. That's not what Trump was operating on, though. Trump woke up one morning without the benefit of any ruling like that, right? Am I right? And he's decided he wanted to put a, a tariff on China. That, that was not as part of a legal process. On the other hand, it seems to me that if China complained that that that, that case or whatever was in the pipeline there mm -hmm. with the WTA was WTO was wrong, then it could reverse. Am I right? It could reverse Trump's tariff. I mean, how do you reverse Trump's tariff? Is there a way, or is he final? Well, actually, it hasn't been implemented. It's not final yet. He can he can make any executive order once and say the statement that we're going to try to proceed this. But in terms of policy wise, you still got to go through the motion, and uh, in terms can, of rule of law, con Congress can reverse yeah, this executive exactly. order. Yeah, exactly. And can the WTO or the or the court in the Hague, uh, you know, the international court, the uh, court of uh, justice, can, can they reverse his order? No, oh yeah, I, definitely. Really? They can say they can say that it's not uh, suitable. It's not part of the uh, Section two three two of National Security Act that uh, the are U.S. Are we is. obligated to follow what is decided uh, in the the court of, in the Hague? Uh, usually, it's like a war opinion in certain aspect. But international, most, yeah, it's like international law, so they do usually comply with it. If you're a yeah. member of the WTO, yeah. well, he may and, not comply and, though. He and may we've say been no, always we... been a law-abiding uh, country with the WTO. So I mean, I, I worry about this as a whole course of conduct, where um, he's taking these steps pretty much for now by himself, and it has an effect in a number of ways all by itself without any real review. Um, and he's, he's, you know, damaging American relations with uh, trading partners going back when. Um, he's dam damaging diplomatic relations with American allies who are not happy with what he's done. 
Uh, and he's damaging business. You could say he's damaging business, such as those companies which rely on, say, Chinese steel mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, make their mm -hmm. steel products and sell their steel products here and around the world. Um, and this, it just seems like there's no recourse. Mm -hmm. he's, 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 he's doubling down on it, mm -hmm. and he's not changing his mind on it, and he's, he's doing it. And I'm just very troubled. How mm -hmm. is this going to wind up, Russell? I think uh, my hunch what's going to happen is like, uh, first of all, the American steel manufacturing, the aluminum, uh, the manufacturers probably benefit and uh, it'll probably go on like two, three years. We have probably that ripple effect with the economy and uh, if they do implement the tariffs on those uh, foreign imports of uh, aluminum and steel, uh, then the American uh, steel companies and aluminum companies going to benefit tremendously, which vice versa. The one the companies that's relying on this foreign uh, aluminum and steel might have a take a loss about four or five percent, but uh, but in the long run, uh, if it's going to create more jobs in the U.S. soil, uh, let it be. Is it? Yeah, I mean, it's going to happen that is way. Is it? Because you know, it's interesting. A lot of this depends on. I just pose one business question to you. A lot of this depends on how long he's going to be in office, right? Because if he could make an executive order like mm -hmm. this, putting a tariff wall up like that, his successor could make an executive you mm -hmm. know, order mm -hmm. taking it right on mm -hmm. down. Okay? So now I'm an investor. I'm a Wall Street bank. Some steel manufacturer comes to me and says, good news, Jay. <clears throat> you know, we have this 25% tariff, and now we can make a lot more steel at our inefficient higher prices, and we want to do that. So, But we need a billion dollars to expand our mill so we can mm -hmm. make more mm -hmm. steel and make mm -hmm. all that money. Mm -hmm. And I say a billion dollars has to be amortized over a period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I give you three years left on him, mm -hmm. and at the end of that time, you know, the Democrats might, might be in control. I don't know what really happened, but the Democrats might be in control. He may not be the next president. The Democrats may turn the whole thing upside down. So <clears throat> if that tariff comes down again, uh, Wall Street says, oh, gee whiz, that may not be a good investment. Because we'll put in a billion dollars, and then that steel company, right, uh, won't, won't have the market because they won't have the protective tariff. Mm -hmm. what, what, can you describe what would happen? Yeah, I think if you got to look in uh, Jay and uh, in two sectors, even the audience got to realize that it's between the public sector and the private sector. And in the public sector, if, if it's a government contract, like you know Donald Trump came up with the two hundred billion dollars infrastructure uh, development plan to invest in railroads, highways, and uh, airports, then those are government contracts, so by American provision will apply. So you got to have American steel, American labor. But if you go to the private sector, develop like building condominiums or hotels or buildings uh, where private contractors and developers are involved, they might have the uh, different, because they were relying on cheap steel from imports, because it's not a government contract. They can mm -hmm. cut corners here and there. So they might, the price of the private sector development might come up a little bit. But in terms of public sector, government contracts by American provisions can apply. Okay, so I'm, I'm, we're difference. about out of time, Russell. And as before, I, we, I always like to get your advice to the president because I think he needs your advice. Um, so there's camera one over there. It's smiling at you. Mm -hmm. Can you please uh, tell uh, President Trump what he should be doing here? I think uh, Donald Trump can, you know, reassess everything and see which direction it's going to take. But uh, it's a sensitive issue, tariffs. Uh, I know that worldwide, all the co uh, countries are trying to be uh, moving the free trade agreements with non-tariffs or non-protectionist movements. But uh, from our point of view, uh, I think we've got to be very careful when we approach this and uh, go which segment and what sector might benefit and uh, approach it in that fashion. Okay, hey, Russell Hanma, uh, he's the senior APEC official here in Hawaii, and he's the author of the APEC Master Plan, and uh, we've been talking about uh, the, the Trump tariffs, both on steel and aluminum, and uh, there will be more coming down the pike, I guarantee. Uh, this is not the end of the story about tariffs and free trade, so you'll be back, right, Russell? Yes, I'll be back again, Jay. Okay, and, Russell uh, Hanma, thank you so much for coming around. Thank you, Jay.